Hey, um, I sat down on Wednesday of this past week, and God really, God really blew my mind with something. You know that, that mind blow emoji where the, the top of the mind is, is gone? That's how I felt when I was sitting in my office, and God was speaking to me. And I want to do my best to give you what God gave me. Are you all ready for a sermon today? Uh, all right. I appreciate that. And uh, I want to welcome everybody that's online with us as well. And uh, in fact, could we clap our hands and welcome everybody that's online and, and some of you are in other cities and other states and, and uh, just by faith put a mind blow emoji into the chat of Facebook, YouTube, all that just because God's about to blow your mind. And I want to build your faith today, fortify and strengthen your faith specifically around the subject of the power of prayer, the power of prayer and uh, to go back a little ways, uh, this past Wednesday, for example, we had our regular every week. We always get together at 6 o'clock on Wednesdays to pray. And to go back a little ways, uh, about a year ago, I just said to myself, I want to just have a set time where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite people. They can come if they want. But to be honest with you, I, don't really, I didn't really care if anybody came or they didn't come. I just wanted to pray. And I've seen the power of God poured out uh, in my life through prayer. And uh, in fact... Probably my life's greatest passion is prayer, and it has been for many years. So I said to myself, let's, let's pray, and whoever comes is fine, but there's going to be no bells, no whistles. Uh, there's no greeters at the door. Uh, it's very simple. It's, it's very raw. We've got very, you know, just a stripped-down band. We've got a few instruments. Uh, but through this past year, it's like more people came, and then, and then more, and more, and more, and more people until on Wednesdays, it looks like church in here. It's crazy, and, and if you've been, you know, and, and it's not just that, but it's, it's God's people in God's presence in prayer, and there are times where it's like the glory of the Lord has so filled the house, I'm not putting anything on, I feel like I can hardly stand, and um, I want to say that whatever happens in this ministry, through this ministry, around this ministry, whenever God moves in power, when somebody's healed, when so, and by the way, it's like healing's breaking out, the healing hand of God. When somebody's healed, when someone's set free, when another person is saved and added to the house, whenever God moves in power, it is a direct result of the fact that people stood and prayed. Uh, when you get a tomato in your garden, you're not like, where'd this tomato come from? You planted a tomato seed, then you got a tomato plant. When, when God breaks out in power, I'm not like, well, where'd this come from? What's, uh, we're missing, what do we do this time? Let's try and do that again. I know exactly where it came from. When God moves in power, it's because people prayed. And by the way, you're invited every single Wednesday. There's, you can just come. Just show up. And um, we're, we're, not, we're not training. We're not preaching. We're not doing. We're just praying. And it's a Holy Spirit prayer. And uh, you, you might be freaked out for a minute, and then you're just going to get in the presence of God, and it will change your whole life. That's, that's money back guarantee. And what's happening is holy. It really is. Uh, I'm not just saying this because I needed something to preach and, okay, well, let's talk about, I, I'm, I'm saying there's a move of God. What's happening is holy. And as I've given myself to study both biblical revival and more contemporary historical revival, there is one very sim simple formula that emerges. Whenever God moves in power, it is preceded by a people that have given themselves to prayer. Period. That's it. Now, let's go to the Bible together. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. It's going to be on the big Bible behind me if you don't have one handy. And uh, by the way, I, I, love, I love my version and my phone app and all that, but there's something about paper Bible, and I think we've got some to hook you up with if you need a paper Bible. In fact, if, if you really, if, even if you don't, come see me. I'll buy you a Bible. I want, I want you to have a Bible. My wife was making fun of me back in the day when we were really super poor in ministry. I'd always be buying somebody a Bible, and I'd get them the nice one. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm like, if you're going to have a Bible, you might as well have one. You don't want that cheap dollar Walmart Bible. Come on, get yourself, get yourself a proper Bible. So if you don't have a Bible, I'll buy you a Bible. How about that? My wife's like, no. Nah. She's with me. She's with me. All right. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus says, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. 
Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, one more section of scripture. Flip forward a few books. Uh, Go to Acts chapter 12, and I want to make a few connections for us today as the Holy Spirit helps me. And Lord, I thank you for your anointing today. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, attending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this was met with approval among the Jews, kind of got the ratings going up in the polls, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. So we've got a match that is set. In this corner, we've got the prison. In this corner, we've got the church that is praying. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell, struck Peter on the side, and woke him up, saying, quick, get up, and the chains fell off of Peter's wrists. I want to show you today as a sermon title, I want to show you some keys to powerful prayer, some keys to powerful prayer. Here's what I have become convinced about. Uh, If there is a believer who is prayerless, uh, it is simply due to the fact that they haven't really grasped prayer's power. Because if you knew the power of prayer, there is no way that you wouldn't pray. And I'm not just talking about that kind of praying that you do, you know, when you order a sketchy burrito from Outlano's late at night. And you decide, I better say a blessing for... By the way, I would recommend that if you do decide to eat there. I've heard several stories of food poisoning. I hope nobody works at Alano's. Nothing but love if you do, but you say you're blessing if you eat there. I'm not talking about that kind of prayer. I'm not talking about the kind of prayer where it's like, okay, the preacher on a Sunday service is given the benedictions about to let you go, so you reverently cross your arms and do what you do. I'm not talking about that kind of prayer. I'm talking about that pray without ceasing, get into God's presence, messy prayer until you draw so close to God, God draws so close to you, your heart is warmed and your perspective is changed and your whole world's turned upside down and heaven unleashes power through your life. I'm talking about that kind of prayer. I wonder, have you ever had, have you ever had a key on your key ring and realize that you have no idea what it goes to? I bet you if we did a little survey right now, there'd be a few people, where you look at your key ring, you'd be like, I don't know what that, I don't know what that little key is. And, and obviously it's important because it was important enough to put on your ring at one point. Some of y'all look like custodians and you really need to thin out your key ring, coming here just jingling, jangling, all these keys, you don't even know what they go to. But I wonder if it's possible that kind of like, Kind of like that key that, you know, we put on our ring but forgot all about what it unlocks and what it goes to and how it's applied. I wonder if at times as believers we, we have keys on our spiritual key ring but have entirely forgotten their power. We have keys and not only any keys but they are keys, Jesus said, to the kingdom. There's great misunderstanding in the The larger body of Christ, now the church, around prayer. And here's why the enemy has worked and toiled and sweated to to sow seeds of misunderstanding around prayer. Because even if you forget about your keys, the devil hasn't forgotten about your keys. And furthermore, the devil knows what will happen if you decide to use your keys. So before I get where... I want to go today, and I want to give you some keys to powerful prayer. I want to sort of back way up and sort of take a a 30,000-foot view at one one of the, what I would call, major biblical doctrines of, of, you know, a theology, Bible, like like a tenet of Bible theology. And I want to look briefly at the doctrine of the sovereignty of God, sovereignty of God. You've no doubt heard people in your life, maybe it was your grandma or some past you had growing up or somebody don't don't really matter but we've all heard people say stuff like like well if it's God's will it's God's will 
and it sounds spiritual, sounds right. You know, people will say stuff like, well, God works in mysterious ways. Where's that in the Bible? You know, go find that. That's, actually, the Bible says just the opposite. God is revealing who he is, not hiding who he is. It's God's will. God's going to do whatever God's going to do. So then we see a verse like where Jesus says, the Father knows exactly what you need before you pray. And we falsely reinterpret it to say, well, if God's will is God's will, we reinterpret a verse like that to say something like this. Instead of saying, the Father has, knows what you need before you pray, instead of that, we reinterpret it and, we, and it says something like, the Father knows what you need, so why pray? Because if God's will is God's will is God's will, then why? We go through life and someone asks, why did that happen? Well, it's, it's God's will. Somebody gets in a car accident and we get together. It's like, well, God's will is, I don't, I don't know. I don't understand God's will, but it's God's will. No, they were texting. <laughs> if we're under the assumption that everything that happens all the time, always, in every case, is because it's God's will, why would we even pray anyway? What it comes down to, and this could be a series, so I'm going to do my best to sort of just squeeze it all in is what it comes down to is a misunderstanding of the doctrine of God's sovereignty. Where we've perhaps had a bad definition, let's work on a biblical definition. By the way, the last few weeks, if you've been around church, I know I've been real preachy. You know, I've been up here shouting and sweating and stomping and doing all that. And today, yeah, well, okay, yeah. Today, I'm going to give you a Bible study because we, we, got a, we got a full, you know, square meal here at the Cause Church. And sometimes you need your vegetables. I don't make any promises. I might get a little preachy, but I'm just saying. When there's a misunderstanding of the sovereignty of God, people, well-meaning people, end up blaming God for tragedies. Or maybe not blaming God outright, but at least have some vague viewpoint that goes something like this. I guess we'll just have to trust the will of God. The problem is that's so unbiblical. Let me show you. I'm going to show you like 74 ways. James 5.14. Is anyone among you sick? Well, here's the often modern interpretation of what comes next. If anyone is among you sick, let's get together, console one another, and say it must be God's mysterious will. That's not what James thought about it. James is getting ready to talk about the power of prayer. And James says, if anyone among you is sick, here's what you're supposed to do. Call for the elders of the church, anoint them with oil, and the prayer of faith will heal the sick. Here's what I'm trying to get at. We got to be careful that we're not blaming God for stuff that has nothing to do with God. Or even worse, sometimes we will call the devil's work God's will. Yes, God is sovereign. Yes, God is in charge. Yes, God reigns over this world and forever always has the final say. But that doesn't mean that everything that happens in this world is God's will for this world. God's in charge. God sets the rules and has all authority. Watch this. But has given stewardship of the earth, this is going to blow your mind, to us. Here comes Adam and Eve. Enter the Garden of Eden. And God is really clear. You can eat any apple you want. Take some red delicious apples. Take the golden crisp apples. Even some, some Fuji apples. Is it Fuji or Fiji? I heard both. We'll just keep moving. <laughs> but whatever you do, don't eat this one. Don't eat the devil's red apple. And what did they do? They ate the devil's red apple. And in so doing, as they believed the lie of the serpent, that their eyes would be open and that they would become like God, they handed over the earth's stewardship to the serpent, to the enemy, to the devil. In that garden, stewardship was handed over. But then here comes Jesus, and now is standing in another garden. 
it wasn't the Garden of Eden. This time it was the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus got in the Father's presence and said, not my will, but yours be done. And Jesus went to the cross. And then Jesus on the third day got up and says, I've taken death, hell, and the grave captive. Oh, and jingle jangle, I got back your keys. Jesus gave us our keys back. That's why at the moment that Jesus said this to Peter, the cross had not been completed yet. And so Jesus put it in a future chance and said, I'm about to give you the keys. I'm going to give you the keys. Because the cross is how I'm going to give you the keys. Now, now let me ask you a question. Is it possible that God's unlimited power has been limited by a lack of prayer? 2 Peter 3 says that God is not willing that any should perish. Okay, let's talk about God's will. What is God's will? I'm not willing that any would perish. But are people perishing? As in, do people die every day without knowing Jesus? And yes, of course they do. But God's not willing, but yet that's how it's working. And what I'm trying to say is that there is an interrupting power of a person that prays. That's why, mom, don't quit praying for your kid. There's power with the person that prays. When the enemy throws you a problem, the church is to stand up and say, not on my watch, I know how to pray. And I'm sick and tired of a weak, anemic, philosophizing church that tries to figure out the mystery of God's will when Jesus made it clear, I've given you the keys, it's time to stand up, to put them in the lock and to use them. There's power in prayer. There's, there's, there's power in, in prayer. Through prayer, we make a way for God's will to fill our world. Because God gave us the keys. Prayer is take, it's, it's what takes what God has willed and ushers it into our world. Jesus said, pray like this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In prayer, I'm saying, God, your will in this place, in this area, in in, in this in this spot of my life, God, this I know this is not your will. Maybe, maybe this is just the as a result of I live in a fallen world, or maybe this is the devil's work, but this is not your will. And so through prayer, I'm making a way for your will to fill my personal world. That's the power of prayer. We're inviting heaven. Jesus said, pray like this. Invite heaven to displace hell. In prayer, we, it's important we understand this. We don't change God's will. We don't need to. We would never want to. Here's why we don't need to change God's will. God's will is always, forever, all the time, better than anything you could ever dream up, ask, or want. So we don't change God's will, but here's what we do in prayer. We lay hold of God's willingness. We, we, don't need, we don't need to coerce God. We don't need to convince God. Prayer is where we connect with God and we discover once again, God, I don't need to change your will. I'm discovering you were already willing. When a leper came to Jesus and said, Jesus, if you're willing, you can make me clean. What did Jesus turn back and say? I am willing what was what was the leper doing essentially maybe they wouldn't have called it this but they were calling out and we could say it like this they were praying and as they prayed they didn't they didn't they didn't change jesus will they discovered jesus will and all of a sudden because they asked what happened their condition was met with christ their leprosy was met with god's love all of a sudden what had always been god's willingness and god's will came crashing into their world and they were made clean jesus says i am willing That's why wherever there is no prayer, there will be no power. There might be lights and there might be haze and there might be a crowd and there might be a good band and there might be a preacher that can preach pretty good, but wherever there's no prayer, there will be no power. And can I tell you that it's the power, it's the anointing, it's the oil of the Holy Spirit. It makes a generational difference. 
it, it, it turns out people that don't show up to church for three months until they f- feel like they got what they need, but, but it produces disciples that go on and run their race and pass it on to the next generation. We need the anointing that breaks off the yoke. We need the anointing that breaks off generational curses. We need the anointing that makes every cancerous cell in someone's body bow at the name of Jesus. The anointing makes the difference. I don't know about you, but I want to go to an anointed church. I need a church full of the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. We need the anointing. Okay, calm down. It's Bible study. So, so, hey, look. Don't confuse it. We don't pray to change God's will in the world. We pray to release God's will in the world. God's willingness. I gave you the keys. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. We got keys this time. We use them. Okay, let me give you a few keys. Here's one. Here's a key to powerful prayer. We pray in Jesus' name. We pray in the name of Jesus. You probably already heard me pray this way. Maybe a few people pray this way. You're always going to hear us pray this way. We don't just pray. We pray in the name of Jesus. John 14, 13. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. That's a staggering promise. That's a profound invitation. Ask anything in my name, anything. So pastor, what should I be praying about? Anything. Ask anything in my name. Now, now maybe don't bring anything and everything and all of it to your cause connect. You might freak them out. Come on, you need at least a, at least a light filter. <laughs> but when it comes to getting in God's presence, pray about anything. Ask anything in my name. Now, if I send somebody in my name and, and I say, you've got power of eternity, you can act in my name, what am I going to expect them to do to represent me well and, and carry my name? So when we pray in the name of Jesus, are we praying for something and about something and around something that represents the name we're praying in? So it's like, well, ask anything in my name, does that mean I just, I just pray and and get whatever I want? Well, sort of. <laughs> but it's more powerful than that. In prayer, and as you get into God's presence, as you draw close in God's presence, God's will becomes what you want. So the picture Jesus has given is not like I'm just, I'm just showing up every time something's wrong in my life and I'm crashing into God in prayer. And, oh, God, can you do this? And, oh, God, you got to fix this. Oh, God, thanks so much. You're so faithful. I'll see you again in 3.4 years. Get whatever I want when I need it. It's, it's that as you walk with Jesus, you discover, God, your will, now my heart is being shaped. My heart's being warmed. My heart's being softened. God, your will is what I want. And as I pray in the name of Jesus, according to God's will, there is nothing impossible to me. Nothing. No qualifier, no little add-on, no little fine print. Nothing is impossible to those who believe. And I hear the Spirit of God saying, use the name of Jesus. Jesus gave us power of eternity, of attorney. Jesus did what we could not do. Jesus took the keys back that we had lost and handed them back to us and says, now evoke the power of my name. Jesus gave us the right to use his name. And so when I pray now in the name of Jesus, this is not just a form. Because I think sometimes we're like, okay, I'm a Christian. How should I pray? I should pray this way. Uh, should, should I pray? I've had people ask me this. How should I pray? Should I pray? Uh, to the Father in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I guess if you want to get technical. But this is not about about it being a form. This is about it adding faith. Because here's what happens. When I pray in the name of Jesus, when I discover this power, I don't ever have to again pray with fear or with condemnation or with guilt or with wondering if God hears me. Because if I had to pray in my name, If I, hey, I'm thankful I don't have to pray in the name of Richner. It's Richner, by the way, not Rickner. I'm thankful I don't have to pray in the name of Aaron, in my name. 
Because I'd, I'd come in there like, here I am in the name of Aaron, and well, you know God, like I'm, I'm a pastor, and I do all that godly, holy stuff. I even know some Hebrew, God. And I'd be instantly disqualified. In fact, the Bible says that my righteousness is as filthy rags. I'll let you Google what that means. It's, and I would be instantly disqualified. God would look at me and say, yeah, but what about the way you were so rude to your wife? And what about when you were looking at your phone when your kids needed attention? What about when you cut that person off in traffic even though you got a cost sticker on your truck? <laughs> my name won't do when it, when it comes to entering into the presence of a holy God who the Bible says lives in inapproachable light. But when I come in the name of Jesus, now I come in his righteousness. Now I come in his holiness. Now I come looking like his perfection. That's where the apostle went to look for the language to use and says, it's kind of like you're clothed in Christ. And so when you come in, in the name of Jesus, all God the Father sees is the beauty of the robes of righteousness of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I am thankful for the name of Jesus. You know, Proverbs 18 it says that the name of the Lord is a strong fortress and the righteous run to it and are safe. You know what that means? The name of the Lord is actually a place. It's a fortress. That's what, that's what the Bible says. It's like a place that you can run to. The righteous run to it and are found safe. Moses, at one point, they're out across the desert. Moses has this relationship with God and and is encountering God. And Moses said something that, that we all say at one point when we kind of, we taste and see and we, we understand, man, this God is incredible. I just, I, and Moses cries out and says, God, show me your glory. You know what God said? Moses, I would if I could, but if I did, your face would melt. I'm paraphrasing. God said, Moses, you can't, you can't see my glory and live. No, no human can ever behold the glory of God. I, come, we, come on, we don't serve a trinket Jesus. We don't serve a, oh, that's nice and happy with the lamb. We serve the God of glory. And, and God says, Moses, here's what I'll do. You can't see my glory and live. Watch this, though. All the Bible nerds, you're going to get this right away. Everybody grew up in Sunday school. You might be able to guess where, where I'm going with this. God said, Moses, I'm going to hide you in a place. Remember, the name of the Lord is a place. And God said, I'm going to hide you in a place. I'll hide you in the rock. Who's the rock? Who's the rock? Come on, I've got a name that I can run to and hide under. And now all of a sudden, come on, I can behold God's glory. I can come into God's presence with confidence and with boldness and with clapping my hands and with singing and with shouting. And when I pray, I believe that I'm going to get answers. And when I pray, I believe God hears me and moves with power on my behalf. Come on, I run and I hide under the name of Jesus. I've got the rock. Woo. Jesus, the rock. Next key, we pray and do not give up. This is a key to powerful prayer. We pray and do not give up. Here we've got this scene in Acts 12 where King Herod, who now has Peter in prison, has just recently arrested James, put James in prison, but then put James to death. So let me submit this to you. No doubt the church that was praying for Peter had prayed for James. What happened with James? James got killed anyway. So what I'm trying to say is that there was, there was no doubt a great temptation to fall into disappointment within the church. But rather than seeing a picture of a church that says, why well, pray? It's not, doesn't seem to be working. Doesn't seem to be affecting anything. Doesn't seem to be changing anything. We don't see a church in disappointment. We see a church that is praying diligently. It says, Peter was put in prison, but the church was praying. Now, now consider this. Consider this, because this is a key to powerful prayer. When it feels like nothing is happening, when it feels like God isn't responding, when it feels like I've prayed and I've prayed and I've prayed again and it isn't working, here's what the Lord showed me. As 
The church was praying. They couldn't see it, but we got to see it. We got a different viewpoint and perspective. But as the church was praying in this room, now in another room, in the prison, all of a sudden, God was showing up in power. But they didn't know it. They were over here in the prayer room, and they couldn't see what was happening in the prison. But as they were praying, they couldn't feel it. They couldn't see it. They, could, they, didn't, they didn't know anything about it. But as they were praying, here was the answer in process. As they continued to persist in prayer, the angel showed up, and initially the locks and chains break off Peter's wrists and ankles. And as they continued to persist in prayer, they couldn't see it in the prayer room, but in the prison, the angel said, get up, grab your robe, it's time to leave. And they couldn't see it in the prayer room, but over here, the prison wall came open, and Peter walked out through the gate by the hand of God, opening it. And what I'm trying to say today is that you might not see it yet, although you're praying, it is in process, and your answer is about to show up and knock on the door, just like Peter knocked knocked on that door. It's in process. So keep persisting in prayer. So we pray and do not give up. That's what Jesus said. Pray and do not give up. Why do we keep praying? I don't have time to preach this all like I want to. I'm going to give you like Cliff Notes version, all right? Some of you are like, oh, Cliff, I remember Cliff Notes from high school. Cliff Notes were my best friend in high school. Bring on the Cliff Notes, preacher. Cliff's Notes? Cliff Notes? I don't know. Watch this. Just, I'm going to give you a few verses just to show you how biblical this concept is. Acts 1.8. You shall receive power. You shall receive power. Luke 25.49. Wait here until you are endued with power. Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Now this phrase, according to the power that is work, at work within us in the Greek, is kata. And, and it implies to measure out, a measurement, to, to measure out. And so what we have here is a phrase that's meaning something along the lines of when you pray, when you ask, when you pray... You are distributing out the power that God has deposited within. You're a measurement, a a distribution. So, So here's a simple question when it comes to prayer. How much of God's power that's been deposited? You don't have some of the Holy Spirit. You don't have some of God's power. You've got all of it. That's who you are by birthright as a Christian. You've got the power. That's what the Bible says. You've got the same power that raised up Christ Jesus from the dead dwelling in your mortal body. It's been deposited. How much of it do you want distributed in in your family, in your marriage, to your business, to your ministry, to to your own mind, to your sense of tomorrow, to your expectation? Why did, after all, why did Elijah pray seven times for it to rain when God already promised it was going to rain? Is it possible That every time Elijah prayed, the power that was deposited was being distributed until the skies had no choice but to respond to God's promise. Come on, it's like the kitchen sink. You know the water's always there. But it doesn't come until you turn on the tap. Prayer turns on the tap. I feel God on that. Prayer turns on the tap. I'm telling you, if we understood the power of prayer, we would never have another prayerless believer. Let me show it to you one more way because I'll make sure you're convinced about this today. Because you got to pray and not give up. Watch this. I'm going to go to Revelation. I'm going to show it to you in the last book of the Bible. Revelation 5.8 tells us about golden bowls that are full of incense, which it says are the prayers of the saints. Now watch this. Revelation 8.3. Spiritual language here. This is a vision of the apostle. He said, another angel who had a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden offer in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God in the angel's hand. Watch this. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. 
There is, according to the book of Revelation, an angel whose job is to add God's firepower to your prayers and then throw them back to earth. And what happens when they hit the earth is there are thunder, lightnings, and, and earthquakes. When the fire is added, when is that all happening? It says very clearly, when the bowls get full. When there was much incense, that's what it says. So here's the question I'm asking. How full are your bowls? Spiritual language, I understand. But if there's a bowl marked family, if there's a bowl marked business, if there's a bowl marked future, if there's a bowl marked, come on, my health, how full are your bowls? Because when they get full, the angel adds God's firepower to your prayer and hurls them back to earth. It sounds a whole lot like when Jesus was describing, pray it like this, on earth as it is in heaven, in my teenager's life as it is in heaven, in my business as it is in heaven, in my body as it is in heaven, in Coeur d'Alene, in my city, in my church as it is in heaven. What would happen if your bowl gets full? All right, final key. I said it, but I want, to, I want to give it to you as a key, and I want to explore the text for just a moment. The band's already up here to sing me out of here and all that, so. Final key, we pray in Jesus' name. We, we pray and do not give up, and finally, we pray and release God's will into our world. Back to our text and this scene that's unfolding in both the church's life and in Peter's life, and Peter is in chains. Peter is all locked up. So, if it was sometimes the modern church, you know, I think the text would have read something like this. As Peter was locked up, the church got together and had a lovely time, and there were refreshments, and they just, they just thought about, well, God's will just really is mysterious. I guess, I guess God wanted Peter to be put to death. But that's not what the text says about the church. Prayer is what happens when somebody of God's people says, I see the devil at work and I refuse. I'm going to release God's will. I see hell. And I got a voice, and in the name of Jesus, I'm going to release heaven. And so the church prayed. The church prayed. Peter was in prison, but the church was praying. And in prayer, they were saying, Lord, Peter locked up is not your will. So, God, we are praying to release your will into Peter's world. And I realized something. I saw something. I got so excited about it. I never made this connection. Can I show it to you, and then I'll get out of here and shut up and send you on your way? Is that all right? Has this been okay so far? Get some Bible study going on today. And get some doctrine and get deep. It's a Bible church. I want to show you this. Watch this. Watch this. In, pr in prison, Peter's wrapped up in chains, locked up. That's what the Bible described. And I'm, and I'm picturing these chains. You know, I'm picturing these, these thick locks, these strong locks and chains. And Peter was all locked up. And then I was thinking about this verse where Jesus had said, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. So... So we've got one scene, oh my God. So we've got one scene where we've got locks and now we've got another scene, another verse all about keys. But watch this, it gets even better. Matthew 16, 18. And I tell you, wait, okay, now remind me, who's locked up in prison? Who is it? That's right, it's Peter. Now go back to the scene about the keys. Who's, who's in locks right now? It's Peter. Now go back to this scene about the keys. And I tell you that you are Peter. Oh my God. And on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Acts 12, 6. The next verse. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two guards bound with two chains. Let me ask you something. How in the world is Peter sleeping hours before he's supposedly to be executed? Sleeping. Those details. I don't know about you, but if I don't know if I'm going to live or die, come on, I have believed on Jesus, but I don't know if I'm going to get the best night's sleep. I 
might be tossing and turning. I might be awake, you know, up on, on the ground like you do. You wake up and you just turn over and just you scroll on Instagram. It's not helping you sleep, but we all do it. It says Peter is sleeping, bound with these chains, sleeping. And I realized I made the connection. It was the same Peter who was in prison who had previously already been handed the keys. You know the only time you can get locked up in chains and in prison and not care is that when you know in your pocket you already have the keys. I might be in prison. Devil, you might have a lock, but I got the key. Oh, God told me to tell you today, church, the devil still has the chains, but you got the keys. I said, the devil still has the chains, but you've got the keys. And even a strong lock, come on, even a strong chain can't hold up against somebody with the key. Now, come on, my lovely assistant. Yeah, come on. (laughs) Now, I wanted I wanted my assistant to be Jeff because it's clear it's obvi- I know this but I think it's clear to everybody Jeff frequents the gymnasium. So I want to get somebody strong for this demonstration. Anybody remember anybody remember the power team? Come on any any 40 year olds remember the power Come on let's go. Well this ain't the power team today. Here's what we do locked up, stuck, don't know what to do next. And we just, we just struggle and we try and we straight, come on, give that a pull. Not, it doesn't doesn't seem to be moving. Now, (laughs) come on, let's, okay, get a better grip. Come on, let's, nothing. And, 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 and here's what we do. We, we strain and we, 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 we don't know what to do next. And we're so confused. And here comes Jesus saying, I know the devil has you in some chains, but I need to remind you, I've given you the key. I'm handed you the key of the kingdom. And this is the difference between the best we can do and the best God can do. The lock might be strong. The chain might be strong. But devil, I came to announce I've got the keys and I'm not afraid to use them. Come on, does anybody know the power of prayer? Prayer. 